and we're going to launch the webinar. Welcome everyone. I can see people coming in through the waiting room. We're just going to give people a few minutes to all come in. And then we'll be launching into this Funding for Writers webinar. This webinar is being recorded, so anyone who is missing any part of it, please don't worry, we will send around a recording link. We also have, as you will see on screen, a live transcription. Um, provided by stage text uh, you can access the live transcription throughout and afterwards should you need it we are in a webinar which means that you as participants aren't visible to us but at the bottom of your screen you will see both a little chat button and on the um uh, and a little q a button on the right hand side Please do feel free to introduce yourself in the chat, tell us who you are, where you're joining us from. And throughout the session, please use the Q&A function, that's again bottom right of your screens, uh, for any particular questions. The structure of this webinar will be each of our speakers will have around five to ten minutes to introduce themselves, tell you about the kind of funding for writers uh, and support for writers that they provide through their organisations here in the UK. And uh, after that, we will move either into a general chat or depending on the number of questions in the Q&A box straight into your questions, because I know this is an opportunity for you to ask specific, direct, practical things while we have these experts in the room. This is the final session of TLC's uh, Writing Soup for the Soul series, which we've been running throughout the summer. It's been a kind of pay what you can uh, series for writers to make things as accessible as possible. And it's all focusing on how we can support writers better in the industry. So please, um, we do encourage comments as well as, as questions for once in these kinds of uh, these kinds of things often discourage comments, but you are warmly welcomed. Um, hello to everybody. I can see all your people uh, introducing themselves from Yorkshire and Chingford and Hull and Sussex and all sorts of places. Uh, please keep introducing yourselves. My name is Aki Schultz. I'm the director of the Literary Consultancy. We are hosts for this evening and your guest speakers who you can see on screen. I'll introduce them in the order that I can see them. We've got Nicola Solomon from the Society of Authors, Eileen Gunn from the Royal Literary Fund, James Urquhart from Arts Council England, who is standing in for Sarah Crown, who unfortunately has a family matter to attend to. I know that we have updated the programme, but for those of you who might have missed that, um, and Beth Gallimore from the Royal Society of Literature. Uh, so just to kick off, I'm going to uh, not talk at, at length about TLC because hopefully you will know who we are and it's not about us today, it's about funding for writers. But we are um, a funded organisation. We offer manuscript assessment and editing and writing services to writers at all levels, um, writing across all formats and genres from all over the world, um, mainly here in the UK, but, but also from anywhere writing in English. Um, we're funded by Arts Council, or part funded by Arts Council, and through the Arts Council we run something called a Quality Writing for All campaign that provides bursaries and funding and opportunities to writers from low income and otherwise marginalised backgrounds. Uh, from the beginning of the period, April 2018, we have provided 900 writers from low income and marginalised backgrounds with support, including 305 bursaries, 634 events tickets, uh, and as a result of that funding, 39% of our programming is bursaried and 20% of our editorial services are bursaried. And we're also very lucky to be working with all of the people that you can see on screen to widen access and outreach and to try and provide the best support that we can for as many writers as possible. Right, I'm going to hand straight over to our speakers for their presentations. I will be spotlighting them so you can see them on screen. Please feel free to use the Q&A throughout to ask your questions. We'll get round to them at the end. Um, so first up, we've got Beth from the Royal Society of Literature. And I'm going to spotlight you, Beth, and hand over to you. Thanks so much, Aki. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks to TLC for having us. Um, as Aki said, I am Beth from the Royal Society of Literature. I'll start by giving a little bit of background on the society, and then I'll move on to talk a little bit about each of our awards and prizes. Um, thank you to Maria at Stage Text for captioning and apologies to you in advance for the fact that 
Geordies tend to speak very quickly, but we'll be fine. Um, the Royal Society of Literature was founded in 1820 to excite literary talent and reward literary merit. We have a fellowship of around 600 of the finest writers working today and are governed by the RSL Council, headed up by our chair, Daljit Nagra, and President Marina Warner. We run a year-round public events programme, as well as outreach programmes, working regularly in schools and prisons. But obviously, what you're here for today is to find out about our funding streams for writers. The RSL administer six awards and prizes, which provide funding for writers at different stages of their career, with the aim of facilitating writing, writers, and readers. I give a little bit of background on each of these funding streams today, but obviously all of this information is widely available on our website should you miss any details, especially if I'm talking a little bit too quickly. You can find out, as I say, about each of the um, announcement dates for these programmes, el eligibility criteria, and when each prize is open for submission via the website, which is rsliterature.org. So first of all, we'll start with the RSL Christopher Bland Prize. This is an annual award of £10,000 to a debut novelist or non-fiction writer, first published aged 50 or over. This prize was launched in 2018 by the Bland family in memory of Sir Christopher Bland, who passed away in 2017. Sir Christopher started his writing career at the age of 76, following a distinguished career in business and the arts. So obviously, his family wanted to continue the legacy that he started in encouraging writers over the age of 50. The 2022 prize will open for entries in September, and the eligibility is as follows. You must be citizen of or resident in the UK or Ireland. Entries can only be made by, by publishers and agents, which is different to the majority of our prizes. Um, and self-published books are not eligible for this prize. The author must be aged 50 or over at the time of publication, which must have been in 2021 or the calendar year in which you apply. Publishers and agents can enter two books by different authors and a list of an additional three titles that the judges may choose to call in. Next up, we have the RSL Jason Open Awards for nonfiction, which are currently open and closing on the 17th of September. There are three awards, one of £10,000, one of £5,000 and one of £2,500, which will provide financial support for talented new writers to complete their first book of nonfiction, especially by buying them time for writing or research. Writers may submit themselves or the publishers or agents may submit on their behalf. The writer, again, must be a citizen of or resident in the UK or Ireland for at least the past three years. The author must not have previously published a work of nonfiction other than something specifically for an academic audience. They must have a contract with the publisher in place and the submission date to the publisher should be no earlier than the 1st of April 2022. The book must be originally published in English and be published in the UK by a UK publisher or in Ireland by a UK or Republic of Ireland based publisher. Next up, we have the RSL Literature Matters Awards, which are a little bit different to the two previous mentioned. The aim of the RSL Literature Matters Awards is to reward and enable literary excellence and innovation. Each year, after an open call for proposals, the awards are given to individual writers or other literary creators, recognising their past achievements and providing them with financial support to undertake a proposed new piece of writing or a literary project. As this was launched as part of the RSL's Literature Matters programme, priority will be given to proposals which either help connect audiences or topics outside of the usual reach of literature and or will help generate public discussion about why literature matters. The 2022 awards will open in spring 2022. Eligibility is as follows. Entrants again must be resident in the UK and be a writer or other literary creator with enough of a successful track record to show that the proposal is likely to succeed. We also accept proposals from small groups of writers, but not from organisations. This must be funding for a new project, which will be com completed within a year of the date of the award being granted. There are £20,000 to be shared between the successful projects. Just to give you a little bit of an example of the range of projects that we fund via Literature Matters Awards. Um, in the previous round of funding, 
we gave 2,000 pounds to Stella Adonia for The Feeling House, which was a short story collection focusing on time, remembering and forgetting, exile and alienation and hearing. 3,500 pounds was granted to Sawad Hussein to support the Billah Hadood Arabic Literature Everywhere Festival, an online literary festival showcasing Arabic literature. And 2,500 pounds was uh, granted to Richard O'Neill to support Bridges to Literature which connects Roma Gypsy pupils to literature through their cultural and oral history. Next up is the RSL Andarchi Prize, an annual award of £10,000 for a distinguished work of fiction, non-fiction or poetry evoking the spirit of a place. We will open for these awards in the 2022 awards in late summer. Recently, Roger Robinson won the prize with his collection of Portable Paradise, which is published by People Tree. And Ruth Gilligan won the 2021 Archie Prize with The Butchers, which is out on Atlantic. Uh, collections of short stories, novellas or children's books are ineligible for this one. The book must be published in the UK that calendar year, and the author must be a citizen of the UK Commonwealth or Republic of Ireland, or have been resident for three years. The book must originally be published in English and published in the UK or Republic of Ireland by a UK or Republic of Ireland publisher. Vanity publishing or self-published books are not accepted for this prize. Each imprint may only submit one work but can give details of an additional three titles that the judges may choose to call in. Then there is the VS Pritchett Prize. Submissions have just closed for this one for 2021. This prize was founded by the RSL at the beginning of the new millennium to commemorate the centenary of an author widely regarded as the finest English short story writer of the 20th century and to preserve a tradition encompassing Pritchett's mastery of narrative. This annual prize of £1,000 goes to the best unpublished short story of the year. The winning entry is also published in Prospect magazine and the RSL Review, which is our annual magazine. The short story must be between 2,000 and 4,000 words. Entrants must be resident in the UK or Republic of Ireland or the Commonwealth. Stories must not have been published previously or broadcast in any other medium. There is no restriction on submitting the same entry to other prizes. Entries must be in English. Multiple entries to this competition are permitted. There is a charge of £7.50 per entry, but there are also free entries available to UK writers on low incomes. Bear with me when I'm there. Lastly, there is the Encore Award, which is an annual prize of £10,000 awarded for the best second novel of the year. The Encore Award was first presented in 1990 to celebrate the achievement of outstanding second novels. The award fills a niche in the catalogue of literary prizes. The 2022 award will be open for entries later in the year. Eligibility is as follows. Collections of short stories, novellas or children's books are ineligible. The book must be published in the UK that calendar year. The author must have been resident in the UK or Republic of Ireland for the past three years. The book must be originally published in English and published in the UK or Ireland by a UK or Irish publisher. And we do accept self-published books, but not those published by Vanity Publisher. There is no limit to how many entries each publisher can submit. There is a top prize of £10,000 for this one and four £500 shortlist prizes. Okay, if, you, if any of you are still with me after all of that information, you deserve at least one of those awards. Um, so please do enter. You can read, as I mentioned earlier, the eligibility criteria for each of the awards and prizes um, and sign up to stay informed when we're open for submission via our website, which once again is rsliterature.org. If you have any very specific questions, please email Martha Stenhouse at rsliterature.org. She is our general manager and leads on all of our awards and prizes. Um, thank you so much for your time and for having us today. Thank you, Beth. Um, we have had a couple of questions about the audio. We will be reset sharing the recording um, and that will include the live transcript that you can download and read alongside this. Hopefully the audio remains um, a bit stronger throughout, but I do apologise for anybody having problems accessing the audio. Um, Nicola, the wonderful CEO of the Society of Authors, is up next to tell us all about what the SOA provides for writers. I will just spotlight you, Nicola. There we go. 
Thanks, Aki. And um, thanks, Beth. And it's really lovely to be on a panel with so many people from organisations that I admire so much and that do so much for writers. And thanks, Maria, for the captioning. Um, I hope you can hear me. If not, put something in the chat and I'll try and speak a bit louder. So I'm from the Society of Authors. It's the trade union for writers. We have about 11,700 members. We've been going since 1884. And our job is to protect the rights and further the interests of authors, or to put it in perhaps more modern language and author language, we're there to empower writers and authors in all sorts of ways. And what we mean by authors is fiction, non-fiction, translators, illustrators, Script writers, comics writers, really any type of writers that you can think of. I would strongly urge anyone who's starting out in a career as an author to have a look, to join us either as a full member or as an emerging member, not only because we do so much in giving advice to authors, but because together we can be very much stronger and do things for one another. Um, so as I say, our job is to empower authors. How do we do that? We do events which are professional development and other events, some things like this, um, and Aki's brilliant event, some things much more community-based to get you to know each other. We provide community with huge numbers now, of local groups, people are able to come together, learn from one another. We have special interest groups, such as our children's writers and illustrators group or educational writers group, where you can both campaign on areas of interest to your group and but talk to others about them. We give personal support. This is what we're really known for. We have six advisors working full time, giving advice on individual contracts and individual issues. And we can deal with those both by advising you on your contract, but also by contacting the industry, um, publishers direct, for example, and lobbying for change or for better conditions. One of the things that we do that's often of a great interest to emerging authors is if people, and you don't have to be a member, see competition terms that are worrying them because they think they might not be fair in any way or transparent, send them to us at the Society of Authors and we will take them up with the competition advisors, uh, organizers rather, and often I will be able to get um, things that, amendments to them, which then benefit everybody. So I'd strongly advise you to do that if you're ever worried as to whether the competition looks fair. So on top of that, we're involved in lobbying government for things to do with improving lives for authors, such as in relation to the um, furlough schemes recently, or copyright, we've just put in something about copyright exhaustion, um, and for engagement in all areas to try to empower authors. But for the purposes of today, what Aki really wanted us to talk about was the funding streams and the way that we can help authors in various ways to get money to further their careers. And we have quite a lot of schemes, mostly They've been funded over the years by authors, members of ours who've left money in their wills or who want to do things to help authors. And there are threefold types of, of scheme that you can apply for. So in kind of order of writing, the first one is that we do buy time to write grants, um, mostly through the Authors Foundation. All of these, by the way, are on our website just look up Society of Authors and grants and prizes and you'll have all the details. Because we have so many prizes, I'm not going to go like Beth and go through exactly who can apply for what. I just suggest you have a look through them and follow the rules on them as to when you apply. But the first type, as I said, a buying time to write grant through the Authors Foundation. We give around £360,000 a year to authors, not one author, to very many authors, um, with grants of, say, three to £6,000 to help you buy time to write. It has to be 
for a project for a commercial project for a UK publisher. But other than that, it can be really of almost any genre. And we have special awards within that for particular types of, of writing, of which the newest one is the World of Books Impact Award, which will be two annual grants of £5,000 each for books of on any genre that have the power to inspire progressive behaviour change. So do apply to us for those. We um, judge them twice a year and, as I said, give out about £360,000 a year. And then once your book is written, we have a huge stable of prizes for writers really at all places in their careers and at all ages. We do uh, our general awards, we do awards, we do translation prizes, awards for audio drama um, and other prizes and awards. But, and those general prizes cover poetry, they cover writers under 35. There's a, a book for the Torday Prize for the a first novel by a writer over 60. Um, everything in between. We now have the Children's Prize, the Queen's Vickers Award for a quirky picture book. So really a huge, huge range of prizes and we strongly um, recommend you to look at them because there are different entries, um, criteria for each. We also do short story awards. The one thing that I would say is that all our awards are free to enter. enter. Our prize has always been free to enter and we are very lucky to be able to fund it, get funded in other ways so we don't ask for entry fees for any of our prizes. And finally, the areas that we can help authors, and I said I'm doing this quite quickly because I think it'd be good to find out exactly what people want to know and, and, and discuss things with us. Um, uh, we have a lot of prizes for what you might call authors in need prizes. And in particular, there is the contingency fund. And that's open to authors. You do have to be an established author, writer, illustrator, um, uh, spoken word artist, for example. And if you need some money in the short term, we have a very, very quick turnaround on our grants where we typically give up to about £2,000. As we always say, you don't have to be starving in a garret to apply for one of our awards. If you need a new computer, if you want need to travel to go on a course, um, look at our awards criteria and apply to us. We turn these round really quickly. We aim to turn them round within a couple of weeks. So if it's something where you need help quickly, do look at our awards. We used to give about £80,000 a year, but last year with the pandemic, we uh, put in, uh, we looked to our industry friends, including Yes, all the people here, uh, particularly thanks to the Arts Council, to the to the Royal Literary Fund, um, to for helping us with giving large amounts of money, so that we could help all the authors who were impacted by the crisis. And last year, we managed to raise and give out one point three million pounds to authors. This year's still been tough, but we're probably on track to be giving out about four hundred fifty thousand pounds by the end of this year and we're certainly going to be doing fundraising to make sure that we can carry on meeting the need because we do foresee it going into next year particularly for children's writers because they still aren't being able to go into schools and do schools visits which are a very important part of their income um, and i should say also in relation to the authors foundation also extremely well supported and heavily supported by the royalty fund which we're very, very great. So that is very quick whiz through the, the three types of award and financial help you can get from us. But don't forget to look on our website and come to us if you've got any questions as to whether you're eligible for anything. And we hope to see you join us in due course. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicola. We've got lots of questions coming in. Just to say, if we could please use the Q&A function, which is that little um, button with two 
speech bubbles on the bottom right of your screen for questions and the chat for some kind of comments and chat i can see that people are introducing themselves in their area which is fantastic just so that we can manage to answer all of your questions right at the end um, and that i don't miss any so please uh, don't worry about repeating yourself if you haven't asked it in the q a but have in the chat just move it over to the q a and we will make sure that we get around to all of those questions at the end of the presentation some fab questions coming in so far please keep them coming um, next up, we've got James Urquhart from Arts Council England, who's here to talk to you about how Arts Council England can help. Uh, just a note for anyone joining us from outside of England, there is an equivalent in other countries, uh, normally Arts Council, whatever the name of the country. Um, so uh, do, do have a look, but they will have similar funding streams available to you. So, James, I will spotlight you now and over to you. Thanks very much. Hello, hello all. Uh, thanks, Aki, for the uh, the opportunity to join this webinar. I'm really pleased to be able to talk to you all. I'm a senior manager for libraries and literature at Arts Council England, and I do apologise that our literature director, Sarah Crown, at the last minute isn't able to join us, which is why I'm afraid you have me. So Arts Council England, it's turning 75 this year. Um, we're the National Development Agency for Arts and Culture in England. We fund a portfolio of around about 900 organisations up and down the country uh, with core funding over uh, three or four year cycles to try and give stability and, and planning time. But we also have open access funds uh, available to organisations and, and individuals. Uh, I'm going to talk briefly about two of our funding programmes that are, are most directly relevant to, to writers of any stripe and, and literature creators. Uh, they are project grants and developing your creative practice. But I'm very happy to follow up with a, a look at the wider landscape of, of support for writers. So first off, Arts Council National Lottery Project Grants, snappy title, aka Project Grants. It's a rolling program. Um, there are no deadlines. Um, the uh, it's, it's available to anyone with an arts and cultural idea for a project. So obviously not just writers. Um, it must be time limited and the project must be delivered within three years from the point of getting the award. We're not quite as snappy as, as uh, Nicola in terms of turning grants around. If you apply for up to £15,000, there's a cutoff threshold at £15,000. If you if you're ask to us is less than £15,000, we'll turn it around in six weeks. If it's more than £15,000, we'll turn it around in 12. Uh, currently, those, those turnaround times are slightly delayed because of pandemic measures, because we're not back in our offices yet, and all my colleagues are working remotely. So... Uh, that's that's our aspirational time. Uh, it may take up to ten weeks for the for the under fifteen thousand at the moment, and a little bit longer for the overs. But we are hoping to move back to uh, regular operation, so to speak, uh, in in the autumn. Um, uh, since the first lockdown last year, Project Grants has a specific focus on small organisations and individual creatives, uh, which is still in place. So that's that's good for individuals and writers. Advice on applications, uh, uh, both in terms of how to use our uh, online application portal, Grantium, uh, and you know what you might put into a, a good application or any questions you have around it is available from our customer service colleagues, uh, primarily. Um, and they are currently only operating a, a, an email service again because we're not back in our offices uh, and access for that is on, is on our website. Um, but again, we, we hope to have a, a fuller service operating uh, in the next few weeks or months. Uh, please do also explore our resources on our website. Uh, they include a general how to apply document, which I, uh, I must admit is slightly lengthy, um, but the, the reason is that it's meant to cover pretty much all eventualities uh, for any type of applicant, any art form, um, uh, including museums and libraries. Uh, there are some good videos on there as well, which are really short and sharp, um, just to, to help get an understanding of tips of how to apply and uh, 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 and some of the best practice in terms of putting together your application. Also, crucially, on our website, there are guidance sheets um, uh, not to do with how to apply to do with specific topics. There's one for literature, uh, and it covers um, about a dozen of the key areas uh, in which we tend to fund literature activities. So that's well worth having a look. You can just Google other browsers are available. Um, something like Arts Council, Project Grants, Literature Guidance, and it will pretty much take you to uh, the web page uh, to discover that. So what literature activities can we fund through Project Grants? Um, digital literature, uh, the quick list here, uh, anything that uses technology to create new forms of work, uh, literature festivals and programming, 
live literature, magazines publishing original fiction and poetry, uh, and that could include uh, newly translated work as well. Participatory actuaries, activity such as such as workshops, uh, publishing, reading for pleasure, creative reading and reader development activities, residences, storytelling, uh, touring, translation, both fiction and poetry being translated into English from another language. We can't normally fund translation from English out into a, uh, into a different language, but working with the British Council sometimes is, is a good opportunity there. Uh, and we we also fund writers creating new work, um, which perhaps is is you know one of the central things to talk about here. Um, I could talk about what we don't fund, but that's probably not what you're most interested in. Uh, those the the guidance sheet that I um, mentioned does flesh out some of those different areas. Uh, if you want specific guidance about that type of activity. Um, and again, our project, uh, our customer service colleagues can explore those ideas with you as well and, and develop them further. Um, flipping over to the second fund, uh, developing your creative practice. This is our flagship fund that is focused explicitly at individuals. Only individuals can apply for this. Um, the, the threshold is between 2,000 and 10,000 um, pounds. And it's, it's not a rolling application. Uh, we have rounds for this, uh, which run every quarter. Uh, the round 11 deadline happens to be tomorrow. Um, I wouldn't recommend suddenly accelerating an application if you're not already in the process of doing that. I anticipate there'll be around 12 um, uh, application deadline at the beginning of December. Um, but at the moment, that's, that's not uh, on our website, I don't think. Um, last autumn, we quadrupled the budget to this um, from somewhere, it was in the region of four, four and a half million, it became 18 million, uh, very much in response to recognising that individuals had often been hardest hit by the pandemic, uh, and that uh, all the benefit of the government's culture recovery fund was very much focused on organisations rather than on individuals and freelancers. So we were really keen to, to put more budget into uh, developing your creative practice as a way of uh, offering funds to individuals. However, unsurprisingly, it's still very heavily subscribed. Uh, currently, the success rate is in the region of 25%, uh, whereas project grants has tended to be in the region of 40%, give or take. Um, uh, but, you know, one in four, um, we, we would still uh, very much encourage uh, applications uh, if it's the right thing for you. Again, there's lots of guidance on our website. But there are also blogs by successful ap applicants, and I, I just want to, to quote one of them, uh, who is uh, Filipino-born British poet Romelin Ante, um, who's based in Wolverhampton. Um, her, her top tip was, uh, develop your creative practice isn't just about allowing you to create new work um, or supporting you financially while in that process. Um, it's also about your development and step change as an artist. My advice to other applicants is to ensure that you can show how you will be able to improve as an artist with the award. For instance, undertaking bolder endeavours, such as working with other artists or a phase of further learning. So do please have a look at the, the respective guidance on our website for those two funds. Uh, and do look at the literature guidance sheets um, uh, in, in the project grants pages. Um, partly because that will, I hope, help you to understand which of those two funds might be the best one for you to go to if, if you feel there's a, you have a proposal that could come to the Arts Council. We can't, um, we, we won't allow a proposal to both funds at the same time, um, uh, but there's, you're certainly very able to put in an application to one and then to another after the first application has been, has been decided upon. So uh, how to choose which fund to opt for? Um, which one is best for you depends very much on the emphasis of your project. The main things to think about are, in, in the simplest possible terms, will your project include opportunities for people to read, hear, interact with or experience your work, in which case project grants is likely to be uh, the one for you. Project grants is all, all about um, uh, enabling the applicant to deliver the project they want to do, but to be a good application it needs to demonstrate how the public can benefit from that as well. Uh, Arts Council uh, in, invests um, uh, lottery money as well as granting aid from Treasury. It's all public money. So what we want to be able to do is support the, um, the artist, artistic and cultural sector, but also 
support the public to get the, the, their bang for their buck as well in, in terms of how can they experience it. So, so if there's that external focus to your, to your project uh, that would enable uh, members of the public to read, hear, interact or experience with your work, then project grants is probably the one to go for. If it's really focused on developing your own creative practice, as it says on the tin, that's probably um, the, the fund for you to go uh, to go for. Um, so they're, they're the two kind of public facing funds that are most relevant to um, in, individual writers. I'll just take a few minutes to say a little bit more about the our wider investment and how that can also support individual writers. Uh, sometimes in terms of, of cash or, or benefits or opportunities uh, for, for writers to, to develop their own career or profile. I guess I shouldn't miss mentioning the Literacy consult Consultancy, um, uh, which, as, as Aki said, is, is one of our national portfolio organisations uh, with a, a wide range of services and support for, for writers nationally, some of which, like the, the Free Reads manuscript, um, uh, sorry, the, feed, the manuscript feedback offer uh, are delivered in partnership with some of the writing development agencies that we, we also fund. Uh, there are around about seven of these up and down the country. They're all quite different, uh, but they have a core offer of supporting writers with advice, networking, mentoring, creative development, platforming in some cases, connectivity with agents and publishers, and, and some of the support for the, the, the business side of, of becoming a writer, as well as the creative and performative side. Um, in addition, they all offer quite individual activities. So, for example, um, New Writing North, based up in Newcastle, uh, delivers all, all that offer to, to writers, but also administers prizes like I think the Gordon Byrne Prize and, and others, uh, and, uh, and runs the Durham Book Festival. Um, spread the word in uh, in Southwest London, uh, Southeast London has very strong support, particularly for younger and diverse writers uh, in the outer London boroughs. Um, many many of these organisations do conferences and you know, quick plug for my uh, given that I'm in the Midlands writing West Midlands uh, has a conference coming up this Saturday um, uh, based at the University of Birmingham uh, booking closes tomorrow lunchtime so if you fancy a crack at that then do look on the writing West Midlands uh, website uh, other national portfolio organisations that we invest in that can support and do support writers include uh, festivals, for example, a library poetry festival in each, each July, uh, or Bradford Literature Festival, all commission writers to, to be on their platforms. Uh, publishers, we fund, we directly fund around about 10 publishers uh, from Nine Arches Press in, in Rugby to, to Blood Axe Books. Um, creative development, there are organisations such as Arvon or the Poetry School that we fund who offer uh, courses, um, paid for courses, residential or online. Uh, they do also provide um, bursary facilities and uh, some uh, accommodation for those on low incomes. Uh, we support touring organisations. So Apples and Snakes, many of you might, might be familiar with in terms of promoting uh, live literature up and down the country. Uh, but perhaps less visible is our funding for the National Rural Touring Forum, um, which uh, works nationwide to support um, arts arts activity of all stripes in in your local village hall and similar. Uh, and an example there would be a project that they developed with um, uh, it was Applause, I think, which which is a touring organisation out in out in the east, uh, based in East Anglia. Uh, they developed a, a program called In Crowd Pub is the Hub, uh, which again commissioned. Uh, performance poets to develop their work to perform in pubs up and down the up and down the country. Uh, so that that was something that put money in the pockets of, of those performance poets and enabled them to develop new new platforms and new listeners um, uh, and and ultimately readers. Uh, last last but not least, um, coming back to project grants, there are some some at scale investments that we've made through project grants that also have direct um relevant to to writers i guess an obvious one is the good literacy literary agency based in bristol um which uh, offers offers support for those outside of the mainstream to access publishing uh largely because it recognizes there is a degree of uh, uh of homogene homogeneity to the uh to the publishing sector uh and that what they want to do is uh support particularly people of color uh, writers of colour, uh, but also um, writers who have uh, 
uh, uh, who come from different backgrounds uh, to access uh, publishing and agenting. And finally, I would suggest um, uh, a large scale project uh, that we fund uh, through the National Literacy Trust called Connecting Stories delivers reading for pleasure hubs in 14 different places up and down the country. And whilst that's primarily a project focused on reading, it's also an example of one where uh, writers will be commissioned locally to uh, to take part in that project and to provide the enthusiasm and the impetus for some of the activities that, that the project delivers. Uh, we also have the remit for public libraries um, uh, in terms of development, not necessarily in terms of core funding, but, but in, also in terms of project funding. We have expanded um, the remit of project grants to enable libraries to apply for um, activities that, that uh, that deliver against their four universal library offers. Two of those are culture and creativity and reading. And we often see uh, libraries um, bringing in applications for activities that include commissioning writers locally um, to deliver activities in, in their patch. So there's a whole range of different investments that we make alongside the open funding programmes that, that writers can apply to directly. Uh, I'm very happy to talk about any of those uh, or, to, or to pick up questions about them. Thank you. Thank you very much, James, for that comprehensive overview of all that ACE offers uh, to support the literature sector and to support writers. So far, we've heard from three organisations supporting writers, um, uh, mostly at the kind of beginning and emerging stages of their careers. Uh, RSL, obviously, lots for published writers as well. Um, but but uh, we've had a few questions about, well, what about unpublished writers? Most, most of the stream, most of the organisations who've already spoken have streams available specifically for unpublished um, uh, writers. But we are also aware that we, we ran an Arts Council funding webinar last year, and we had a, a big contingency there of writers who said, well, just because I'm published doesn't mean that the support continues. So we recognise that there is a real need for support across career path for a writer, which is why we have uh, Eileen from the Royal Literary Fund here to talk about how exactly RLF support in that area. So Eileen, I'm just going to spotlight you and you can talk about this particular funding stream for writers. Thank you, Aki. Um, as Aki said, um, we are here for further down a writer's career. Um, we are a charity. We've been going since 1790 continuously, um, essentially a benevolent fund for published authors. Um, so writers who we actually are here for people who have setbacks, either professional, perhaps their publisher has let them down, or, or personal setbacks, which can happen to all of us. Um, so we don't actually give grants for projects or work in progress. We give grants to help people with their living costs. Um, so obviously part of that would be a means tested form, which would have to be completed. Um, we also have a literary merit part of the process. So writers who apply have to publish a minimum of two full length books as sole author. Uh, and we ask um, for examples of the books so that our trustees can read them and approve them for literary merit. That's the process that we've all, always gone through. That could change in the future. Um, there's lots of information on our website about the grants and there's also ex videos of writers who've been helped by the fund and the difference that it's made to them. Um, sometimes people apply and it will be maybe just for a one-off because they're going through cancer treatments. Occasionally it'll be because they're older and they can't get the commissions any longer. Um, so then we're here for more longer term help. Um, we call, when we give uh, annual grants to older writers, we actually call them pensions, but they are in fact annual grants. So we give one off grants to help with particular situations and people can reapply after three years if their situation continues or things haven't picked up. So once people are in, um, you know, they can keep in touch with us, um, let us know how things are going, and there's a possibility then of further grants. 
There's also, um, as you'll see from the website, rlf.org.uk. Um, in the last 20 years, um, we started a fellowship scheme for writers, which puts writers in universities to help students with practical writing. And that's been very popular. People have get a stipend of about 15,000 a year for two days contact. It's one-to-one -one contact with the students. That's been very, that's been extremely popular. Um, but that again, doesn't mean that you can't apply for a grant if things are particularly bad. Um, so as I said, um, it's the living cost that we'll be helping people with paying rent, having debts, um, that kind of thing. We, the trustees meet every month except August. Um, we try and turn things around as quickly as possible but because the trustees have to read the work, that could be six weeks or more. Uh, when I send out, when people make first contact, I explain how things work and then confirm their eligibility and then send a form so that people can fill it in and then return it with the books. Uh, some people return that immediately, so it's dealt with quickly. Some people might take a few months. Obviously, it's difficult for people to sometimes think about applying for charity. So some people think, oh, other people are worse off, worse off than me and, or I'll put it off in case something better comes along. But, you know, things can happen to any writer, no matter how successful. You'd be surprised at how many people um, who might be names that you know who have applied to the fund. So, so one shouldn't be hesitant about the fact that you might feel ashamed of contacting a charity, because that's what we're here for. Um, we're also well off because for, for centuries we weren't. And then we received large legacies from A.A. Milne and Somerset Mom, and we received royalties from those currently as well. Um, so we don't have government funding, we're independent, and, and we have the funds to help everyone who applies. So we don't have a quota system every month. Everyone's looked at individually, and if the, the trustees decide that they can help them, we actually help them the day after the meeting. As I said, most of that is on the website. I think that we, we help... Um, approximately 200 writers every year. And then we have the Writers and the Fellowship Scheme, which since it started, we now have um, writers in universities all around the country. So I think that really covers it. As I said, we, you know, we can't help with projects, but we're here when something happens and you need a bit of financial help to get you through it. Thank you, Eileen. Thank you so much. So we've heard now the spectrum of support that's available for writers from beginning a project right the way up to maintaining a career and also maintaining resilience in what is a particularly challenging time, but has always been a challenging landscape for writers and for individual creative artists across disciplines. Um, so we'll, we'll probably we'll try and cover some of that in our wider chat, which we will begin now. I can see that we have had questions coming in. Just a reminder, you do have that Q&A function. Please, um, now is your chance to ask specific questions while you have these people in the room. Um, we've had a few questions actually uh, uh, for, for people right at the beginning, so um, that they might be sort of works in progress who don't have a career behind them. So perhaps we could just get a reminder of the kinds of support that are available for people who are not professional authors, perhaps um, from each of you, just specifically for those who are struggling with overwhelm, with feeling like there's so many different offers. I'm right at the beginning of my career, what might I look at? So perhaps if there's sort of one tip from each of you from your organisations, a first step for someone who's right at the beginning of their career. Nicola, I'll come to you first because um, it, it seems an obvious place to start. 
so obviously in terms of advice and help then you can come to society authors but in terms of money it is true and i know something that people struggle with from all of us you do have to show that you've got an established career for most grants for the um for the authors foundation you have your grant your project has to be a commercial project for a uk publisher you don't have to have been published previously but if you haven't been then we would expect that you have a contract with a publisher to publish the book so what you can't do is come to us with an idea but unless it's already been picked up by a publisher and most of our um, awards are in that category however many of our prizes are also open to self-published authors not all of them you need to look through but the short story awards for example um, are and just look through many you know, as i say some are some aren't open to books that are traditionally published um, but yes i appreciate that many people are concerned that at the time they're trying to build a career that there isn't financial help there and then i would probably say talk to the arts council um, for, for help and again obviously in order to get our hardship awards you do have to show that you have an established career as an author. Mm. I think it's quite a tricky bind, isn't it? Because understandably, some bodies will need proof that there is something that they're supporting for, for an outcome. And, and we are a very outcome and output based industry. And I think that, that de developing your creative practice is quite unique in this field. And I'm very glad that Arts Council has developed it um, as a strand. It's a relatively new um, strand of funding, so DYCP. But I would say before we go to James to talk about why DYCP is good, particularly for unpublished, as yet unpublished authors, um, with my TLC hat on, I would say is what you need money right now or is it professional development um is it community is it support from people who are validating you as a writer and what are the sources that what, what are the places that you might find those things outside of cash funding streams i know it's very difficult because um it can feel like we're already sacrificing so much but there are opportunities to access additional professional development to help you explore with your with your new idea for a book with your first idea for a book what you're doing with it and how to develop um, your craft as a writer in order to build something that you can decide whether you wish to have it published and if so how to pursue that or whether you're doing something different with your art i think we can be swayed by this idea that to be a writer you must be aiming for a bestseller list but actually it's perfectly fine to understand your own motivations as a writer and to, to get exactly the sort of help you need rather than vaguely casting for something and um, which brings me to james so it was interesting james then because we've had this question i think dycp is a brilliant stream for unpublished uh, writers but with a uh, what was it 25 percent success rate um wh why do you feel that uh, and i know i happen to know internally that you don't get as many writers applying because it's open to artists isn't it it's not just writers all, yeah all, all, all our all our programs are available to all exactly so i'm just wondering why you feel it is that you don't get as many writers as say theater practitioners or um other art, visual artists applying to this fund and what Ooh. might we be thinking about as writers coming to dycp knowing that there is a low yeah. a relatively low success rate that's really interesting that that opens up a philosophical question uh, which i won't go down too much but Something that we do recognise um, within the literature team in, in, in the Arts Council is that actually, uh, um, if, if you're a visual artist, you know that you can come to the Arts Council with a project or a plan or an idea for R&D and involved applying to, to a funding programme. Um, what we've found is that that, um, uh, less quick to put themselves forward for personal funding and it might be because actually it does feel very personal you're you're asking for cash to support you as a as a writer as an individual um and that i think sometimes that happens. Uh, um, oh, james your is, connection is a little bit 
um, disruptive the, there. The creative practice. Okay. Make it any clearer. There we go. It's a little bit clearer. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, so developing your creative practice that the does need that does need to be um, some evidence that you can show um, that you have a creative practice. It's you know what what is it that you're trying to develop? Where have you started from, and where do you want to move to? So you can't come to that fund completely new and say I want to be a writer. Um, this of this fund obviously is the way I can develop to be a writer. You have to have some um, some existing practice to build on. That doesn't mean you have to have a, a, a publishing history. Um, it, it means that you need to be able to demonstrate that you uh, have experience of writing and, and have been working uh, at uh, your creativity. Um, and there are, there are ways that you can um, access more help and, and support and guidance along the way that will, that will strengthen your application. So, for example, if you have uh, if you manage to get in touch with your local writer development agency because they do cover the whole tree um, they are often a really good source of advice sometimes practical help uh, sometimes uh, pointers around this is how you might shape a, an application um, but they they can really help with um, just interrogating your um, your your ambitions and your skills Hope and what what you actually want to achieve um, and that that will help you to kind of put together an application that might be slightly more um, than just applying to developing your creative practice and, and and saying this is where I want to go to the the other thing I would say is project grants we do we do fund unpublished writers through project grants uh, it's it's not that common um, because we always have to balance those two those two factors that I mentioned earlier, um, the supporting the art and the, and the artists and the writers, but also supporting, you know, the benefit is for the public. When we're funding writers to develop their, to say, develop their next novel or, the, or their next book of poetry, the, um, the public doesn't get to see that unless it actually gets published. So one of the, one of the decision making factors um, is often uh, is there a likelihood of this person getting published if we uh, fund them through project grants uh, and that's where it can be really difficult so all the other things that you can do without getting published such as being in contact with your writing development agencies seeing if you can uh, generate interest online whether it's by blogging whether it's by uh, taking part in local community arts activities and share finding ways of sharing your work as work in progress taking part in local festivals just to share bits of your work or being on uh, on panels of for example local writers um, all these are kind of what you might call quite lo-fi elements that you can bring together and uh, and and show here here are all the different aspects to my writing career uh, and that begins to build quite a powerful picture you don't have to have a public publication deal behind you um, to, to be successful with uh with with project grants or developing your creative practice what you do need is a really clear project and direction of travel if you like an ambition what what do you want to get out of this and where ultimately will it take you as a writer Ooh. so it sounds like you well, it's funny we have a workshop which is called finding power finding purpose at tlc and we we do an exercise where we write an artist statement so visual artists are very good at writing artist statements which is a little kind of mission statement for you and you have a mini business plan that flows from that writers tend to be less good at, at doing that but we ask a, a few central questions and, and they're mainly based around why you're writing and um, what, what James is saying about making a strong application and this will apply to any of the funding streams you need to have a clear idea of why you're doing it and what you you will aim to get out of it so it, it, um, I think writers can tend to story tell in applications why it's important to them we're very good at saying this is really critical to me for these reasons we're less good at saying this this is the pathway this is the timeline this will be the output um, which sounds a bit clinical um, but, but can stand you in good stead to have a really clear idea of where you're going with your writing where your writing is going rather than where you're going necessarily so what am i doing with this what is what am i putting into the world uh, rather than what do i want 
to do or where do I want to be in five years? What will this book allow me to do? It, it might be a better way of framing it. We've had a question about nonfiction um, um, and we've also had a, a question about sort of theatre. So um, Beth, I think you mentioned there was there were a couple of nonfiction strands, weren't there? Could you just remind us for the person who's asked the question? You're, you're just on mute there still, Beth. There we go. Um, that's correct. So the Giles St. Auburn Awards are specifically for nonfiction. Um, so that's the perfect opportunity for anyone who is um, currently unpublished and wants to apply for that award. You can look up details on our website. Um, just to go back to the previous question about um, generally unpublished writers, there are a few opportunities available that we touched upon previously, which were the Literature Matters Award and the VS Pritchett, which are both um, open to unpublished writers. But there was one I didn't mention because it isn't directly associated with the funding stream, which is the Sky Arts RSL Writers Award. That is a mentorship program um, for emerging writers of colour. We launched that this year um, for the first uh, round of applications. Um, we are hoping to run that program again next year, um, but that is a year long mentoring program for unpublished writers of colour and I think um, a brilliant opportunity with some incredible mentors, including Bernadina Baristo, uh, for a year long um, yes, mentoring sessions and uh, development of practice, which I think calls back to some of the questions that have appeared in the Q&A so far, yeah, specifically for um, nonfiction. So Giles St Albans, so please do look that up on our website. I have a, a barking dog in the background. I do apologise. The doorbell has just gone. I don't know who's delivering something to us at this stage. Um, I, I'm, I'm very sorry for that. Um, but uh, Eileen, we've got one actually for people who do have a track record, but they are self-published. Is the RLF open to uh, people who are self-published with several titles and if not might it consider it in the future um if if it's solely self-published work um sometimes people who've had a couple of books published then decide to go down the self-published route um that would be fine but we would have to have to commercially publish books or perform plays which i should have said earlier um but yes i mean things are changing at the at the RLF it's possible that we might I think we probably will have to look at that in the future because it is a way for even established writers to go forward so um yes I would kind of watch this space really we're starting a revolution guys yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Nicola you got your hand up <laughs> I just want to answer on, on a couple of questions one is we also have a number of um awards for non-fiction and in fact a new award coming up which will also cover fiction as well as non-fiction which is the Volcano Prize which is um, a prize or oh, that's another one um, that's going to be a prize for a novel I forgot for going, focusing on the experience of travel away from home but we have a number of prizes that are for non-fiction and for fiction and our Authors Foundation Awards um, also are for non-fiction. We do some historical prizes, some educational prizes. So a real range, have a look. But a question that's been asked, that I think is really important for me to answer is you do not have to be a member of the Society of Authors to apply for any of our awards and prizes. They are run by separate charities. They're all open to anybody. There's, there's absolutely no obligation to be a member of the Society of Authors. And I would hate anyone to think that, that, that they did have to be a member. I think it would be remiss of me, however, not to say that, that um, membership is something to consider for particular kinds of reasons. So do you want to give us a very brief overview of the membership, Nicola? Well, that's really kind of you. Uh, yes, I, of course, think everyone should join the Society of Authors. And that, as I really said at the beginning, because you get community, you get um, help, tailored help with any question at any time so you can send almost any question in and we'll answer it you get access to a number a huge number of free meetings you are you can put in touch with other writers there's a lot of um access to things like very low low rate insurance for you so it's it's helpful 
to get access to insurance that you couldn't get for other areas. And you make a difference. The more we work together, the more we can improve things and the more people send us suggestions about things that aren't working, the more we can help make that better. So yes, I absolutely would suggest that anyone joins. It also can be set up against tax and it really doesn't cost very much, about £100 a year, um, a bit less actually than other members. But, but as I say, it doesn't make any difference to us when you apply to our funds, to our grants and to our wards, whether or not you're a member. No, no member gets counted and that is really important to make sure these are all charitable awards. Thank you, Nicola. And also somebody uh, just on self-publishing, because we've had a couple of things in the chat and in the in the Q&A here. Um, the Alliance of Independent Authors is a fantastic membership organisation that is trying to professionalise the process of self-publishing and have been for a number of years, headed up by Orna Ross, who is a force of nature. Um, they are well worth it. They've got a free resource page uh, for, for, for non-members where you can get lots of advice on professionalising your self-publishing practice. Um, and I think that they're really moving at policy level to say we stand for high quality self-publishing because if we can we can push for professionalizing it we can push for recognition from grants and bodies that this is uh, the kind of thing that they should be also funding and supporting so um you know any moves you can make as james was saying earlier to establish your craft and have a really professionalized attitude towards it should professionalizing it be your aim Again, I think you need to be really clear what your aims are with your writing are um, well, well worth it. Um, we've had a couple of questions which I think are for specific um, people. So I'm just, but I'm just going to ask um, one thing which, which I was really interested in, um, which is um, I would love to know about um, kind of demand for particular kinds of funding and and rates of application. So um, for all of you, I suppose, I'd really love to know, and I think people listening would love to know, if there are areas where you're finding there is a lot of demand, which suggests that there is a big need, um, and any areas where you're um, perhaps not receiving as many applications as you'd like and you'd like to encourage more. Um, Beth, should we start with you for kind of the price strands? Uh, and or the wider work of, of the RSL with its fellows and kind of community groups as well. Yeah, of course. I think um, particularly over the past 18 months, there has been a real sense of um, community that has been um, required from our members and fellows. We have really tried to stay in touch with all of our members, fellows and friends of the RSL throughout. And I think it's been mentioned a few times in the chat that that's what people need from the ground up is feeling like they're being supported. We feel like the RSL is a republic of writers and that we are all here together to support one another throughout the journey of a career. Um, awards and prizes have kind of fluctuated throughout the past 18 months. Some prizes have seen incredible application and some have um, received fewer than we would expect normally but one in particular to mention is the Sky Arts Writers Award for Emerging Writers of Colour um, and the take up for that has been absolutely phenomenal so as I mentioned earlier we will be seeking to continue that in future years. Um, I think as I, yeah, as I mentioned earlier it is that sense of community that people are missing right now and that's what uh, bolsters our sense of confidence in our own work and um, helps us grow as practitioners and I think that each of the organizations represented here provide that for writers so all of us are trying to band together to create that sense within um, within our followings and memberships so I hope that we can really capture these national and um, international audiences that we've been able to speak for and with throughout the digitization of our events and programs over the past 18 months. Thanks, Beth. Um, and James, you mentioned earlier that actually the DYCP budget has quadrupled, which at a time like this is kind of extraordinary. And it suggests the Arts Council is trying to respond to need as it arises, which is good that there's sort of um, in the moment response. Have there been other areas or, or maybe it's just this one where you've seen a real spike in demand for a particular thing coming from creative individual creative artists? 
Um, thanks, Aki. And uh, sorry, I realise I was typing answers to some of the questions in in the chat uh, without muting my microphone. So I'm sorry if you've got a, a general rumble in the background there. Um, yes, uh, the, the it's uh, probably I probably wouldn't call it a spike um, at the moment, but there is a really significant demand um, across all art forms, um, uh, including writers and and those producing um, developing literary literary project ideas. Um, the you know there has been some really really heavy um, demand for the developing your creative practice um, uh, funding program simply because that is so specifically focused on individuals um, and and is quite a good match for writers. So the you know the the, the success rate there is currently around about twenty five percent, but earlier in the year it was significantly lower. I think it did go down to about ten percent earlier in the year, um, which which we were all um, pretty unhappy with. So that is rising um, and we have put more money into it. Project grants um, is relatively stable in terms of applications. Um, back in back in the old days, we used to get about 10,000 applications a year um, and uh, a, a slice of which would be literature. I, I'm afraid I don't know what the current um, turnover of, of project grants applications is, um, but but I, I think the success rate is in the region of 35 to 45%, which you know, one in three is, I, I would hope, well worth a shot. What we would say, though, is we're really keen to find ways of supporting people to put in the best application they can, rather than put in something that they might still have questions about, or they think, well, I need to to, to, to put in one and have it turned down and then move on, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. We, we really don't, you know, we, we want to fund good applications. So there's no, there's no requirement at all on our part. In fact, we actively discourage the sense that you might need to, to have a go at an application and be unsuccessful and then try and get feedback and then take it further. We'd sooner give you feedback if we possibly can up front so that as, as far as possible, um, we can help you to get it, get a really, a really cracking application in first time. Thank you. Eileen, I'd love to hear whether from your um, communities of published writers, you know, because you are there for living costs, for wraparound costs, that, that is so, um, that's really missing from a lot of the offers that we see. And I think we need to have much more of this. Um, but are you hearing from your members that there are particular, um, I don't know, times in the career or particular things that they're really struggling with? It'd be really useful to hear that. Um, I mean, at the moment, I think we're finding uh, there's more applications from younger writers because uh, younger writers have often had to have other jobs alongside um, their literary earnings. So they have um, workshops, freelance teaching, all kinds of things. And all of those things have, unfortunately, a lot of those things have disappeared in the past year. So people are coming for that reason. Um, I mean, we've always had uh, our applications are, are, are from people where something unpredictable has happened, so we can't always um, see that there's a particular group that are worst hit. I mean, we, we do help people across all genres as well, novelists, children's writers, playwrights, poets, nonfiction, all of the, all of the written genres we help people in, apart, apart from academic work. Um, that's not eligible if it's the result of a PhD or that kind of thing. But yes, um, I mean, sometimes I feel that we maybe should have had more um, writers applying in the, the sort of climate that we're in now. So we, you know, we hope to spread the word. Um, the fact that we have the fellowship scheme has taken a lot of uh, writers um, away from the need to apply for a grant because they're receiving this stipend to do work, which, which in fact they most, mostly really enjoyed. So that has helped in a way. And after fellowship schemes, people are involved in other projects, um, which the RLF support, social sector projects, reading round, that's reading groups for the public. Um, so we're able to maintain, in fact, paying, paying writers um, and which, Obviously, most writers do prefer to be paid for work rather than to have to apply for a grant. Um, and I think, again, that's taken people away from the need to apply for a grant. And then, of course, there's the wonderful emergency fund that Nicola's running. 
um, which we were able to support because we knew that would be the first port of call for a lot of people. And, and also the Society of Authors can help writers that wouldn't actually be eligible at the Royal Literary Fund. So, you know, it kind of covers all the angles, even people that we couldn't have helped if they'd come to us directly. Mm. And I think also, I mean, you know, we, we, the literature world is quite small, but it still mm. surprises me how um, people sometimes aren't aware of some of the streams that are available and some of the support mm. systems. So anything we can do to get the word out and encourage yeah, people to, yeah. to see, um, visit and go to your, your, your local library network. Actually, they're very strong a support system for lots of writers, your regional literature partner. I, in yes. the chat, I have popped a little map there for regional literature partners um, and you can go and see their work. They are often funded as well um, and that therefore can offer subsidy on on. Um, various bits of work, whether that be events, workshops, professional development, editing. We've had a couple of questions about editing. Um, for feed manuscript feedback, um, we, we've got our free read scheme for copy editing and proofreading. Because that is work carried out by freelancers, it's unlikely to be centrally funded and organised because it's quite hard for a freelance copy editor to set up as some sort of help with a charity arm. Um, uh, Nicola, I'm going to come to you um, before we have our kind of uh, a couple of wrap up questions just on this idea of whether you've noticed, because uh, I know that the SOA is particularly responsive to um, writers' needs. You do a lot of research, policy, advocating and lobbying, um, which also needs to happen around these kinds of services to keep them going, to keep them funded and to keep them dynamic and responding to real need rather than assumed need. Um, what have you seen as the areas of need at the moment? I mean, I think it's it's really important to say, you know, there have been people asking about why we support authors who are already established. And as you rightly said, people need support right through their career. And that is both the kind of support, the kind of knowledge that you do so brilliantly and that others here do and that we do to connect people to their needs and the validation they need and so on, but also to money. Secondly, it is really worth always looking at the author's licensing and collecting society's um, own figures that show that the median earnings of a full-time professional author are around £10,500 a year. That is very little by anybody's standards and therefore people do need money right through their careers. And certainly, as Eileen said, we also see many writers who you may think are really quite well known, you would definitely know their names, who are coming to us for grants support throughout their career and and we have to be imaginative in how we do it and that is a number of things like the policy work we do for example some of the lobbying we did to government to extend the self-employed income support scheme meant that many more people were eligible and that's a lot more money than any of us can give through our scheme so it's really important we lobby that that the world understands the way that authors' incomes work and things that can impact on that you might not even think about, like changes to tax, like making tax digital, which both makes it very, very hard to fill in your tax returns, but also means that no one's taking account of the fact that authors' incomes are lumpy and that they have to, if they have to do quarterly reporting, it's really difficult for them. So it's a much wider question than just where you get the money from. But yes, to look at who has really suffered during the pandemic in particular, there are a number of people who this felt very hard on. Publishers did not do, do, do too badly and book sales overall did not go down. And people thought, well, that's great. But actually what that really meant, particularly at the times when bookshops were closed, and if people were mostly buying their books from supermarkets and from big platforms like Amazon, you are buying the books of the names you know. You do not go in and just make a purchase of a book you don't know. Consequently, as my mother always likes to say, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer because all those books that are well known are making more sales, but debut authors are suffering, middleist authors are suffering, specialist authors, those who would be hand sold by their own bookshops are suffering. And that is hard for us to know the effects of yet because those royalty statements haven't come through but certainly that's what we're hearing from agents and then on top of that it's the fact that people really don't understand 
how authors make their money, um, as Eileen said, from working in other areas to support it. And in particular, those of our members who do appearances, I've already mentioned children's authors, but also poets who work in small venues that aren't reopening. All of that support work that people did for their careers was difficult. And then another big area to look at is teaching. Many, many authors teach, but often they teach in, on, for example, creative writing courses, and they are teaching on zero hours contracts. So at the beginning, they weren't furloughed, they were just let go. And that meant that their income stopped overnight. And that's why the claims on our contingency fund were huge, but all of those problems are continuing. Not all of them have solved. Of course, thank goodness, bookshops will be open. Of course, people are buying, but it takes a while. And it may mean that publishers did, they did a lot of delaying of putting books out and they may be commissioning more safely. And that's always problematic for us as well. If books that came out during the pandemic didn't do very well, then that author has bad track and may not be commissioned for another book. So, so these are a number, I'm sorry, it's rather a long answer to a short question. Do I see a lot of problematic ways that of, of things coming in? Yes, I do. And since discoverability is always such a big issue for authors, everyone's had to fight really hard to think of new ways to get people to know about their books, to see their books and whatever. And that is in itself really complex. And these are all things that we talk about a lot, the Society of Authors and, and our members talk about with one another. And, and we have specialist branches and specialist areas who can talk about it. So that, that can be really helpful. And again, I would urge people to join just for the support and validation and help for your questions that it gives you. Thank you, Nicola. And I think also what's come out of that, which is which we should mention today, is that funding for writers and support for writers can coexist with a culture in which fair pay is normal. It should not exist because it has to exist because without it, the entire system would collapse. So one thing I would say is that I understand people are attending this to think about how they might apply for cash funding, stipends, bursaries, etc. But it's really important that we are all understanding that if we want to be part of this ecology, we also need to be thinking about ways that we can support the infrastructure as it currently stands, which means buying, being careful and ethical about how and where we buy our books. Um, remember, if, it, if it's from a supermarket or from Amazon, um, uh, the, there is a huge discount um, and uh, profits are squeezed at either end. The publisher is disadvantaged. The writer is massively disadvantaged. We need to be um, very aware of all of this if we're to have this conversation and to continue to have support that allows us to um, think of this as complementary rather than a necessary crop uh, uh, kind of support system. Um, I think that is important to say. Um, I do have a final question, which I hope will answer some of the uh, uh, questions that are in that are quite specific to, to individual cases in the Q and A. Um, but uh, if I, if you could each give one sort of top tip on somebody's coming to you, they're preparing an application. What would be your top tip for making sure that application is as strong as humanly possible? Um, so. Um, Eileen, let's start with you. I mean, mine would be, you know, if you're not sure which of your books to send or how to fill in parts of the application, get in touch with me and, and I can help. Um, don't struggle unnecessarily. That would be my top tip. And we will include, when we send things around, we'll in, um, with your permission, Eileen, we'll include your contact details should people want to hear more about that. Yes. Um, Beth, your top mm. tip for people coming to one of the um, prizes or project streams from... Please just read and reread the eligibility. Um, it's all laid out as clear as we could possibly make it. If you have any questions, please do get in touch with us um, at info at rsliterature.org. We don't, um, you know, we're not trying to hide any information or make anything unclear. So if anything is unclear, please do get in touch and we'll do our best to clarify that for you. James, um, I think probably given the people we have in the room, um, it might be useful to have a kind of DYCP specific uh, because we've had lots of questions about, you know, it's R&D, it's time to write, it's kind of, I'm, I'm wanting to move forward with this. 
someone sitting down to do their DYCP application, what's your top tip to make the application really solid? Uh, in a nutshell, probably, um, why are you passionate about what you want to do? That passion always comes across uh, in, in, in an application and it's very refreshing and exciting and, and ultimately very fundable. Uh, my top tip would probably be to try and, you know, as Beth has said, please look as closely as you can at the guidance for the for the funding program and then try and address the the questions. And I would suggest you read it to a friend who doesn't necessarily um, uh, isn't necessarily wrapped up in your career. If it makes sense to them, then you're probably on the right track. But find with, with the DYCP fund, finding a way of demonstrating why funds, uh, public funds from from that uh, program uh, invested in you would move you on from where you are now into a into a different place, rather than just allowing you to subsist and do a bit more of what you already do. Very sage advice. Thank you, James. Um, and Nicola, your top tip. I mean, apart from absolutely agreeing with everything everyone else had said, and you know, make sure you're applying in the right way, on the right form, following the rules for the right thing, make it easy for us to help you. But I would say something else, which is don't be modest. I think that writers often will not really tell us of their achievements. Or, so we're not convinced that, they, that they've got a whole track record because they haven't given it to us. So we all don't like bigging ourselves up, but you have to. And I would really recommend you do that. And I agree with James, ask someone else to see it. And I just want to end up with something else. Don't ignore money that is there for the taking. And if anybody has had anything published, that would include articles, books, or anything else. Do make sure that you are signed up to the Authors and Licensing Collecting Society and to Public Lending Rights, both of which give you free money. And the number of people who are not signed up to ALCS would, and who would get checks of two or three hundred pounds a year for doing, you know, whatever you've written, sign up to those organisations and get free money because having a bit of free money helps you have the time to sit down and do these applications properly and get more money. And writing is that kind of piecemeal putting things together. So make sure you put the time in and make sure you tell us how great you are. Um, and there was one final question actually, which I've just actually really apropos here. Somebody said, how do, what can we include things that we've done on our application? Yes, do. If you've had a uh, professional intervention, you've been to workshop, it might seem small to you, but it shows that you're serious about your writing practice. That's all worth putting in there and then run it by somebody who you trust to be um, honest with you. So absolutely don't be modest, be very clear. All of these tips are fantastic. And I really hope that they've been used useful to you if you're thinking about making an application and I would uh, my final tip would also be um, take a step back and a moment before you rush into an application and please um, to keep a record of things whether that be a spreadsheet or just a note on your calendar when you've submitted something to where and what the timeline for response is because managing our anxiety and our well-being while we are writing applications and trying to make a living and trying to live and survive through the pandemic and be an artist and do other things is hard, it's challenging. This is not something that uh, we are expecting you all to be absolutely brilliant at all the time. You must protect yourself and your well-being to, in order to be the most creative and most resilient version of yourself as an artist and as a human being as possible. So please take very good care of yourselves, be focused, be targeted, be strategic, and apply for what you actually want and need um, and dream big but don't feel pressured to apply for something just because you think you should um, your happiness is at stake here and your creativity and those things are valuable and those things are what we as industry people value the most so please protect yourselves and your creativity because we need your stories now in the future and always whatever format they might be delivered in thank you so much everyone for being here um, and thank you so much to our guests, to Eileen, to James, to Nicola, and to Beth, and to Maria for being an absolute champion and hero with her live captioning. I really hope this has been useful. Um, and I do apologize if we've missed any specific questions. I will share around contact details so that if there is a burning question we haven't addressed, you can get in touch with us. Um, seeing all your messages here. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's been really lovely having you and enjoy the rest of your evenings.
Take care, everyone.